Hello, this is Reverend Dr. Chris Wilson, and uh, thank you for coming back. This is uh, session two of a series we're doing on the Gospel of Matthew, a, a series entitled Jesus as Rabbi Through the Lens of Matthew's Gospel. And in the last session, first session, we did a kind of an overview of Matthew's Gospel and the qualities of how that Gospel has uh, a deep, rich heritage in the Jewish faith. And we talked uh, toward the end of that session of the structure of Matthew and how there are five major teaching moments that Jesus has throughout the gospel. And today's session, the second session today, is looking at that first uh, major discourse that Jesus gives in Matthew's gospel. And the first major discourse is often known as the Sermon on the Mount. We will find it in, in chapters five, six, and seven of Matthew's Gospel. And this well-known Sermon on the Mount, um, this first reflection that Jesus gives, this what I would call a rabbinical style of teaching, uh, we kind of get some, some direct hints that it's a Jewish way of teaching. So it's, uh, I would say the Sermon on the Mount reflects much of what uh, the Hebrew people would have thought about in terms of a rabbi teaching them in their own Jewish heritage. Uh, I would say also there is a hint of, of Jesus having some similarities. If they were to read this gospel for the first time and begin observing Jesus in the reading of this gospel, they would observe some qualities much like Moses in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, one of the things we as this, as this section is called the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus went up a mountain, went up on the hillside to teach. It's well known in, in Jewish history that you go up a mountain either to teach or to receive something. Something significant is going to happen on a mountain. When Moses went up Mount Sinai and received that original covenant, it was that going up a mountain that signified something happening between God and and God's people. And so Jesus going up a hillside or going up a mountain to teach would have signified a significant moment uh, that would have been a very Jewish thing to do. Um, the other is that he goes up the mountain and he sits on the mountain or sits on the hillside. And that sitting posture would have been a sitting, it would have been a posture of a rabbi to sit or to lounge and to have those gathered around that rabbi to listen and to learn from that particular teacher. And so he goes up the mountain. Something significant is going to happen, but he also sits, which is a, a gesture of a, of a rabbi teaching posture. So that's going on. The other is it's symbolic of what would happen in a synagogue. Of you would have kind of key leaders up close to the person teaching, and then all the crowd gathers around. And in this opening of chapter five, Jesus goes up the mountain. The disciples, who are Jesus' followers, come up close and gather around him. But we also know the crowds are also kind of within earshot of what Jesus is teaching. It's almost as if you're in a synagogue and the key leaders are up close and everyone else is gathered around and can be a part of that teaching or learning experience. And so that Sermon on the Mount almost models what would happen in a Jewish context of teaching. And so very directly in this opening first discourse that Jesus gives has a very Jewish quality to it from beginning to end. Uh, John Meyer, who uh, is a scholar on Matthew and has shared quite a bit about this, says there are three particular things that happen in this Sermon on the Mount that are important for us, this unpacking of these three chapters, three things happen. One is Jesus functions as a herald of the kingdom. Is He is a, a good news of the kingdom or kingdom. Uh, he is wanting to tell people about God's realm. The second is that Jesus functions as a teacher of morality through the laws of faith they already knew that he was trying to, to lift up the tradition of which they're a part, and as we will see, transforms or renews those teachings with a fresh set of eyes and a fresh set of ears of how they, how they hear, listen, respond, and incorporate that which Jesus teaches about the tradition of which they already know. 
The third part uh, that Meyer talks about is that Jesus sees himself, and we, I mentioned this in the first session, is he comes not to dismiss their tradition, but to fulfill or enhance the tradition of which they're already connected to. So all that's important that John Mercer does all these things, or John Meyer does all these things. I mentioned John Mercer because he has a unique way, and I'm gonna show a slide on the screen, is Sermon on the Mount can be broken down in six parts. So chapter five has two parts, chapter six has two parts, and chapter seven has two parts. So I'm gonna put that screen up for you. And John Mercer describes uh, this Sermon on the Mount as being known as a follower of the way. And that was one of the early ways we learned that there were people that were kind of following Jesus is they were early on knew, known as followers of the way. And Jerry Mercer talks about the structure of Matthew, Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. And it's kind of divided, as I said, in six parts. And the thing I love about how Mercer breaks up this first discourse, he uses that way language, a joyful way, a deeper way, a secret way, a restful way, a humble way, a narrow way. And you'll see the, the breakdown of the chapters and verses for each of those six parts. Um, but one of the things I love about the breakdown of that is the idea of we are part of a way. It's not just a rule. It's just not a guideline. There is a way of life that Jesus is teaching those in that moment, but is also teaching us. That joyful way is that familiar part of the Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those. He has those blessed statements that we find in the early part of chapter five in Matthew's gospel. And those blessed statements are meant to be a joyful way. And blessed can mean happy or joyful. And as we think about that, it's not like happy in the moment. It's kind of embodying a joyful spirit. And the challenge with that joyful way is, is that Jesus uh, really pushes the listeners. Uh, blessed are those who are poor. And happy are those who are poor. And as we unpack each of the phrases of those Beatitudes, that joyful way is joy is really found this way, maybe rather than the way you understand joy. And in that first part, that Beatitudes, is almost Jesus redefining joy for us and how joy is to be understood and lived in our life and our faith. The deeper way, the second half of chapter five, is kind of a retooling of how they understood the practice of their faith. Um, in that second half of chapter five, there are six kind of themes that Jesus talks about. He talks about anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and enemies. And with each of those topics, Jesus starts out by saying, you have heard that it's said, which he's basically saying, this is what you know as a part of your tradition. But then he goes on to say, but I say unto you, you have heard that it's said, but I say unto you, he's saying, this is what you know, but I'm gonna offer you a new way to think about what you already know. And so, uh, Mercer calls that the deeper way. It says, it's one thing to know something, but then to be taught that same thing with a refreshed perspective allows us for it to have a deeper meaning in our life. So that deeper way is diving in to what they already knew about their Jewish tradition and enhancing, tweaking, changing, and transforming the way they understood how they lived out their heritage. The secret way, which is the start of chapter six, is really um, recognizing that one's faith doesn't have to be done in front of other people. Um, how when you pray, you pray in private, not to be seen by others, not to kind of let others see you as a spectacle or to say, look at me and how great I can do and live the faith. 
Jesus is saying in that secret way how it is that you cultivate this relationship with God not to impress other people, but simply to strengthen your life. The last part of chapter six is called the restful way. Um, how, we, how we calm our minds and spirits, how we, how we essentially try not to worry about the things that go on, how we stay present to the present moment of the life we are called to lead. The last part, chapter seven, is that shift, that humble way and narrow way, is recognizing that this way, this path that Jesus is offering to us is not some just simple thing. It's not some easy thing that anybody can do. It, it asks something of us, demands something of us. That if we're gonna be a part of this way, we're gonna be a follower of Jesus, if we're gonna be connected to God's presence, that it's a covenant. There are things that God does for us, but there are also some expectations of what we provide in that covenantal relationship. There's dedication and time and commitment, discipleship, all those pieces. That narrow way says, not that it's limited, that only a few people get in it. That's not the narrowing. The narrowing way is it's asking something significant of us if we're going to be a part of this expression of faith. So if you look at chapters 5, 6, and 7, chapter 5 is really the, the idea of how one approaches the faith with new eyes. Chapter 6 is that inner belief, that inner cultivation of self, and that chapter 7 encourages us to take that faith out into the world and live that world, not for it to be just beliefs that we have, but that our beliefs become actions every day of our lives. And like good, any good teacher or rabbi, Jesus does not teach anything that he's not willing to embody or live out himself. And so this chapters five, six, and seven, I've often thought of these, these three chapters as an example of how Jesus practices his ministry from chapter eight all the way to the end of cha or chapter 28. So the rest of the gospel, Jesus is modeling with his words, his actions, his teachings, his living, everything he does is modeled in chapters five, six, and seven. These three chapters represent the entirety of all of Jesus' ministry from teaching to living. Jesus teaches these words to the disciples to begin to shape them and who they are and what they will experience in the years to come these teachings and these truths that he passes on to them in the Sermon on the Mount ends up being the very fabric, the very foundation that they will need to encounter all that they will see, all the miracles that will be experienced, all the different people that they encounter, people on the margins, people that are in authority. They will have to draw back to this chapters five, six, and seven of what Jesus taught to help them navigate through all they will see and experience. One can appreciate the fact that Jesus does not want to eliminate his Jewish faith, but seeks to transform the outlook people have on the faith that they already have. Jesus speaks, as I say, about embodying his faith into everyday Jewish people and also eventually to Gentile people as well so they feel strengthened to connect to God in a more meaningful way. It's assumed that Jesus' problem is not with the fact that they had a code to live by, but that religious leaders of his tradition used that code to stay in power and to seek to protect the institution of which they're a part. Jesus, on the other hand, is, is really speaking to the average person. And he's saying, this code you live by shouldn't be wielded over you, shouldn't be used to control you. This code that you live by should be something that allows you to seek a deeper relationship with God, that allows your faith to have more meaning and purpose. To it. The movement of these three chapters helps us form a reinterpretation to renewed living of faith. Jesus shifts 
with those listeners from being rule followers to disciples of a path. The overall tenor of this discourse reclaims as embodied through Jesus, approaching life with humility and appreciation for others. Jesus seeks in this first discourse to teach the opportunity to be excited and renewed interest in faith itself that will sustain them for the future, not to have an excitement for the moment, but an excitement that will sustain them every day of their lives. The closing of this discourse is intentional about what Jesus wants the listeners to do, to listen and live out what they hear, and to recognize that listening with no action is like being a foolish person. Knowing the right thing to do and following through, Jesus leads them to the water, but the listener must take their first step and go from the edge of the water to drinking the water themselves. I mentioned Gene Boring at, at the beginning. Uh, Gene Boring suggests um, this idea of Jesus having kind of a motif of Moses. And this suggested Sermon on the Mount for Jewish readers of the first century, they would have looked at Jesus almost like a Moses character, a fulfillment of things to come. As Moses brought down that initial law from Mount Sinai, in this case, Jesus is bringing down the existing law to be received with a renewed sense of discovery, a renewed sense of covenant, a renewed sense of what it means to be God's people on this earth. So the Sermon on the Mount really sets the stage for the other discourses, but for Jesus himself and the disciples and everything else they will experience throughout the telling of Matthew's gospel. So this kind of brings some closure to our uh, first uh, discourse discussion on chapters five through seven. The uh, the next session, which you'll uh, look at, the session three, we will look at the missionary discourse or the mission discourse. It's essentially the sending out of the disciples to go and begin to activate this renewed faith these disciples have. So I hope you'll join us for session three. Thank you for being here for today and as we begin to continue looking at the Jewish qualities of Matthew's gospel. Thanks so much.